Hey, it's Antonia Dodge with Personality Hacker. And Joel and I are in love flow because we just got done with our live five day profiler training event in Washington, DC. This video is giving you one of the highlights of that five day event when our friend Dr. Dario Nardi agreed to come out and give a talk on our main stage about some of the brain scan technology findings that he's come up with. Now, Dario Nardi is the author of Neuroscience of Personality and he's kind of well known in the industry as the person who's pioneering brain scan technology around personality types. In this particular video, he's gonna talk about some of his findings and in particular around one type ENFP. So, hope you enjoy Dr. Nardi's talk. Testing, testing. Is that good? Oh yeah, yeah. It's okay. It's just for the camera, actually. So. It's just for the camera. <laughs> Got it. Yes. Um, yeah. So I, I have to confess, I had a little bit of an impetus to come out here. Besides um, loving these two folks here and what they're doing, is that my mom only lives about 15 minutes away. So it was really great opportunity to visit my mom too, who um, will be. Uh, is she? Are you here yet? I can't see all the way. No, probably not. But she'll be coming. Um, so yeah, as some of you are familiar with my research since 2006 on some stuff with the brain and type, and um, especially in the last few years, I've really been able to collect lots of subjects and like get the little intern elves uh, to crank out some numbers and do some stuff. So even if you aren't familiar with what I've been doing, all good. If you are familiar, I have new material. Yeah. Oh. Nobody has seen all of what you're going to see tonight. Some folks have seen about half of this in San Diego, about 20 of them, and that's it. Uh, so I'm super stoked. Now, we're going to be focusing on one type. And you might think, oh, no, I hope it's my type. What is it going to be? It's going to be ENFPs. Um, woo! That's right. Woohoo. Um, However, what the, the point is, the, the principles we're going to see, though, are principles, because already the interns are working on other types like INTJ and ISTP, ESTP, um, seeing the same pattern. So the stuff you're going to see is all relevant. Because, you know, what, what is the quote? Um, I don't even remember. It's been around the type community for so long. Uh, every ENFP is like every other ENFP is like some other ENFP is like no other ENFP. And so when you're working with people or maybe it's just casual and like the bar and you're trying to figure out what's this person's type and sometimes you have the feeling like, oh, this is very stereotypical ENFP. And then other times you're like, eh, I don't know, this is like an ENFJ-ish ENFP or like more introverted, like shy ENFP or like party animal ENFP. Any of you ENFPs have a party animal phase? You know, the, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, we're gonna be looking at the effect of age, career, culture, and sex. And those all show up in the brain. And I'm gonna take you on a little bit of a journey because they don't all affect equally all at the same time. You know, career isn't gonna have a big effect from people who are on tw you know, 20 years old, but by the time we look at people who are 60, they've been practicing the same thing or several of the same things for decades. So we're going to see stuff um, in the expression of personality. And you might wonder, well, the brain, you know, people really hope. And, and of course, this was my hope at the beginning, too. All we need to do is give people brain scans, and then we would know what type they are. And it didn't turn out that way. Why, why is it not that way? Because there's brain, which is like the hardware, and then there's mind, which is like information processing. So it's like software. And then there's psyche. And Carl Jung was very concerned with psyche. So that's the person within the system. And so the whole point of type is not just like, you know, metabolizing information in the brain. It's about how do I relate to the people and the environment around me and in myself and to the unconscious and like all of these things. All of the stuff is going on. So it's not a surprise. There's not a one-to-one -one match and that's fine because people tend to develop the parts of their brain that meet their practical needs, like getting through the school system and also their psychological needs. And I think that's important to keep in mind any time when a person has a set of skills or behaviors, where did that come from? You know, one of the questions you can ask is like, when did you start this behavior? Were you like this as a teenager? Um, but also what needs is it meeting? Is it career needs, or practical needs? You know, uh, even for some types, figuring out how to do dating is like a really big thing they have to figure out. For other types, it's a little bit easier. 
or is it meeting just pure psychological need? Somewhere in between there. So our agenda is to take an in-depth look at one type, look at these different factors, and I'm going to be reporting. We have 42 ENFPs now. In fact, even the last time I presented, we had 37 ENFPs, and already there have been five more ENFPs. Um, that doesn't mean I don't need more ENFPs, because they're always nice to have in the lab. Um, and the whole idea is to help you understand these other factors, how they affect type, so that you can better type people properly, as well as perhaps understanding your own development or ENFPs that you know. Um, and even if you're not ENFP and you don't know any ENFPs at all in your life, which might be possible, still the, the principles that you're going to see are things that so far we're looking at they hold true. I originally was going to show some examples that was like compared to INTJ and ISFP and so on, and then I realized each one deserves so much in-depth treatment I can't just like show a slide. Like this just felt wrong as a research person that, and, and just as a type person that felt wrong. Um, it's a little bit about me if, if you don't know what I do. By the way, I'm holding this so I don't trip over it, um, which could certainly happen. But I just realized if I put this like here, that's probably okay. As long as that doesn't mess up the sound system as I move around, I don't know. By the way, the other reason to come here is so I could wear fancy clothes because I don't normally dress this way. So that's like a third reason. Yeah. Um, over, I, I did hear, and I wasn't sure if it's a compliment or not. You know, sometimes on the internet people see me and they're like, oh no, Dario is really like an ENFP or ISFP or INFJ or whatever it is. So I'm not normally, you know, have to, you know, I'm dressed up like this at conferences. So maybe this is how people know me. Consistent image. Uh, I, I, I don't know if you all can really see that, but they're just views of people wearing this funny nylon cap that looks like an elf cap at Christmas, and they're doing a variety of activities. And when I did my book in 2011, that was just like a pilot study. It was a 65 college students. Now it's like over, we've, I don't know how many people there are, 320, something like that. All different ages, of course, all types still. Um, I think the smallest Number, there are 10 ESTPs and 10 ESTJs. So I think that's the smallest number of any particular type. Um, ESTP, very hard to get into the lab. I've tried bribing them with like beers and all of these things. Um, slowly but surely, their friends, you know, convince them to come in. Uh, they do a variety of activities for one hour in the standardized protocol where they do like meditation and reading and listening to music and playing video games and doing speed dating. Um, yeah, they do speed dating. Um, even if they're married, they still have to do speed dating. Um, and there's, I know we modified the instructions. It's not a big deal. And they do a variety of math problems. You know, you think, oh my God, I'm getting my brain scan and I'm using math problems. Do you know how Americans feel about that? <laughs> um, I have a colleague in India who has been scanning people in Mumbai. Uh, and I've done this also. I have like over 30 people from the UK. And by the way, anybody here from Britain? Anyone? Oh, fantastic. Yes. Um, British brains are different than American brains. Yeah. No, I, and I thought that was just going to be a joke, sort of. I was like, oh, we're European. And I really actually mean just European Union and Britain. Uh, but they're, specifically male British brains are different than American male brains. And, and I thought it was just a joke. But that abstract use of language and sarcasm and all of that like, really is more developed for, for Brits. And that's um, whatever one can make of it. Yeah? Okay, so they, they do all these activities. I record all of the data. It's run through the computer. Thank goodness I have the little elf intern so that they, because repeating the same protocol like 300 times causes madness. I mean, especially INFJs, INTJs. Can you imagine doing the same thing for one hour, like year after year? And no. Um, so they do a whole bunch of stuff. And one of the things, which again, you sort of can't see that, but maybe you know that's not a good example either. Um, that's a bird's eye view of the brain. Okay, so this is just like looking down, and I don't map the whole brain because I'm using EEG or electroencephalogram. So this is just like the outer layer of the brain, the neocortex, but that's the part that makes us special as humans. It's like one inch thick, like it's got all the stuff going on, it's the result of education, like consciousness is going on there, um, and pretty much is helping us with everything that we could possibly do. And, and many times specific parts will light up, so like this part of the brain right here, on the left side, in the front, behind your forehead, avoid any damage to that part. That's like your left executive region, and that's involved with things. When, when does it light up? When people make decisions, uh, when they give explanations for why they made their decisions. In fact, it's really cool. 
um, just to give a sense of how insane the brain is. Um, two, two examples, but I'll, I'll start with that one. One is, I, I'm going to tell you something, okay, but, or I'm going to ask a question, and it's going to be like, it doesn't make any sense, but I want you to make up the answer, and you'll understand when you hear the question. Today, why is it that you decided to wear a blue blouse? You were feeling blue, okay. She's not wearing a blue blouse, by the way, for those who can't see that. So this part of the brain lights up, and it turns out for most people, only that part lights up when people give reasons, even if they're totally false. So it's confabulation. Humans are really good at that. The other thing that's really neat is we have amazing field of view, like 120 degrees and up and down, like humans have amazing vision, not like eagles, but fantastic. And you have a nose in front, like, in, in like the very middle of it. And yet, when you look, you no normally see your nose. Where is it? What is the brain doing? Like, why don't you see your own nose? Because the brain just edits it out at every second and like fills it in what, you, what it thinks is going to be there. So our, our brain does some weird stuff and it helps us with everything, including the things we're unaware of, voice tone and intention and tracking things as they move through space, at forming mental plans, visualizing, uh, modesty. You know, it's possible, by the way, if you have some damage to this part of the brain right here, you could suddenly become very immodest. Oh, I don't need those clothes. <laughs> no, I mean, this happens. I mean, it's sort of sad, but like, thank goodness for people who suffer, you know, ac uh, brain injury from accidents, because we've learned so much from them. I say that somewhat, you know, I don't really mean that. There are other ways to find things out. Uh, there's a whole, and this map is not just my map. This is me looking through all the literature, and half of the stuff you can find by just cracking open any neuroscience textbook. The other half is you can go to a place like Wikipedia, and you look up and you find different regions of different sensors, and you figure out, you know, what does the latest research say? Where can you go read articles about it and go read those? And these are things I've seen myself. The brain is helping us with a lot of stuff. It's our toolbox. It's our orchestra. From all of that, I want to get to this which is, what is an ENFP? And there are different ways to answer this question. So it's like a Myers-Briggs code, which isn't what Carl Jung came up with originally, uh, which means, you know, like extroverting and intuiting and feeling and perceiving. We could also say that uh, if Linda Behrens were here, it would be the get things going, temp uh, like a catalyst temperament and interaction style. So there's, there's that view. Then we know what the functions. So it's extroverted intuiting is dominant, then it's auxiliary, it's assistant, is, is introverted feeling, and then there's some other stuff that's going on there. Um, I call it the, let me give a little name for it, the discover advocate. And that's, um, other people view them as discoverers and they view themselves as advocates, or is it the other way around? Um, I like giving two names to the types. But there's this you know, holistic way we can look at types too, these themes that we know. And that's the whole point of getting familiar with type because if you just had like a single line definition like intuiting means this and sensing means that, you'd be missing so much because people are organic and interesting and variable and give surprises and contextual. And there are these themes that just come up time and again like ENFPs have a, like a fifth sense for what is your story? What stories are going on with you? Here, let me intervene in that story a little bit and see like how you respond to that. So there are these things that, you know, I'm trying to bring together neuroscience on the one side and, and this sort of like, I don't want to say vague model because Jung meant this, of course, very precisely, but as a therapeutic model, as a narrative model, as, as a psychological model, psyche, the person within the system. And what are some things then I've, I've had in between? Well, I have uh, 42 subjects, I mentioned that, uh, and they do a one hour protocol. They vary all the way from age 16 to age, well, I know there's an 80 something person, but he's an ISTJ, uh, so 78. Uh, I've used two different machines. Actually, I'll even show a third one, but the one I'm showing today, I don't actually use that for research. That this like, you know, uh, consumer grade, fun, fun kind of thing. Um, Lots of sensors, not tons, like 19, 20 sensors. Uh, I used very traditional methods of analyzing the data and also some, I don't wanna say non-traditional, they're slightly less popular. So it's like this Hebbian learning model that brain people use. Not quite as popular, but it's there. I tried it out, I like it. Um, 
then I look and you know, compute averages for different things. And it's not easy. It's not just like you get one little signal from the brain. The machine reads 256 readings a second and from 20 different sensors. And then the information it's sending is like multi-factor. It's like when you turn on the radio, you can tune it and you can hear different stations. The different stations are different frequencies. And then you can change the volume and, and there's you know, the same thing. You need to decode it. And there's this decoding process that happens. Um, are there biases? Yes, yeah, 78%, uh, and this is, is overall, uh, are college-educated white Europeans or Americans who self-selected to be involved. It's not terribly far away from the general American European population, but I think especially the educated and self-selected is, is a little bit sketchy. It's been hard to get uh, folks with sensing preference who are blue-collar workers. Just haven't had some opportunities, but they haven't come through yet. I'd like to see more of that because I don't want to get this, what's called weird. People who are Western and industrialized and educated. And then, oh, what does the R and the D stand for? D is democratic, R is for, I don't know. But, but it's this acronym that basically describes like all the people we use for brain research are really weird compared to the human population on the earth. Um, <coughs> Details, if you can read this chart carefully, <laughs> uh, I don't even go over this normally while it's there. Um, I put together the chart when there was 37 people just uh, uh, like a month ago, and now there's more. But it's basically breaking down by each EEG, like what were the age ranges, um, how many were male and female, what kind of professions were they in, you know, I gather that kind of information. What was their ethnicity and break it down. And there's good numbers, like in terms of male and female, they're almost equal. Um, in terms of age ranges, most people are in the 25 to 55 range, but there's younger and older too. Like there's enough people to have meaningful statistics. And in the careers, there's also people who are artists and cinematographers and educators and psychologists and counselors and uh, engineers, scientists, uh, people who work in business management. ENFPs are drawn to business management. I think that's that inner ESTJ. As they get a little bit older, they're like, ooh, money. And, <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, oh, I don't actually have to do anything as a manager either. I just inspire people. Um, I know some ENFPs who have said that. That's why I mention it. Um, and so there's two ways we can break down the data. One of them is just what we see when the person is there for one hour. Which parts of the brain are more active? And activity is measured a couple of different ways, but I just squish it into one thing for the purpose of this presentation. Um, but that isn't the only way to analyze the data. So we're going to do a little brief thing about what we see when people are actually sitting there, which is a context. And in that context, they're doing lots of different things. Like I said, listening to music and doing math problems and drawing and speed dating. But that isn't maybe representative. You know, the person's also wearing a strange cap and maybe they know me. Or as one of them recently, not an ENFP, but another subject, he's like, you know, I was really attracted to one of the interns that actually impact the results. Like you really asked that? I'm like, oh, that's, I, it might have. Um, I, you know, that's a good point. Um, fortunately, there's a method that's been developed about 10 years ago that allows us to find how the different regions cooperate in the brain, how they synchronize. And that synchronizing follows a principle. Neurons that fire together are wired together. And that wiring only happens because of years of habit and practice. So there's a really nice statistical technique that you can go in and you create this network and it's like, despite what you saw during the session, the person's brain is actually wired like this, which could be different. And then we get into things like midlife, but we're not gonna talk about that much, sorry. Um, so what are we measuring? We're measuring live neocortex brain activity, the surface of the brain. Um, amplitude, frequency, so I'd like to say, think of a radio. You know, there are two things about when you turn the radio station. First, what kind of music are you listening to? Is it like really fast frequency, so it's like dance music? Is it gonna be like slow, easy listening, put you to sleep, that's like you know low frequency stuff? And then the volume, because you know, you can listen to like, what is it, techno, but on like really low volume. Or you can listen to easy listening, like blasting. Anybody listen to easy listening, blasting? Ooh, excellent, okay, you know what I mean. Yeah, that's a nice flow state there. Um, and then the result is showing where the person is placing effort and interest, where they're placing their attention. It doesn't mean skill. 
And I think it's important to understand when we see this. At this point, it's not about skill. It's just interest and attention. And what are we, so, well, again, you want to look at this really closely. <laughs> now, what the result is, is that there are these 19 or 20, uh, I added one more brain region recently to be able to be measured. Um, and it just, there's this bar chart that's developed. And the bar chart is basically telling us that how active each brain region was. And um, the bars are all vary between 40 and 60%. It's like normalized, you know, between like zero and 100 kind of thing. They're all between 40 and 60%. And ENFPs, as a general rule, are generalists. And I, I haven't been surprised at all. When I go and ENFP comes in, especially if they're ENFP manager or artist, something like that, they come in and it's just like all the brain regions are sort of equally used. Uh, they go over here and then, yeah, over here and then over here. And, you know, it's sort of uh, the, the metaphor I like to use is that a check comes into a company. And normally in, in like a normal company, you say like ISTJ company, the check just goes to the accounting department and then that's it. But in the ENFP company, everybody gets to see the check and like potentially have some thoughts and feel some rewards and, and feel good about it. So there, there isn't, there's sort of generalist. There's no like, Individual ENFPs can have their favorite regions, but in general, they tend to be in this 40 to 60% range. There's not something that's like way out there that's like, ooh, you know, their very, they're very biggest favorite thing. Um, now, as we look at this, we still want to know though, like do ENFPs have more like goal-focused approach? This is like this part of the brain here. The, you, you basically, if your brain were a company, you'd have two CEOs, goal-focused CEO and open-ended CEO left and right prefrontal cortex. Not the whole brain, just the, like the very front part, um, where your forehead is. Uh, the open-ended CEO is a little bit stronger. Is anyone surprised by that? Are ENFPs more goal-focused or open-ended? Open-ended, even when they're goal-focused, they're still open-ended. So I don't think we're really surprised by that. The difference is not huge, it's slight, but I think for adults, you know, ENFPs still get through life like everybody else does. So that, you know, we both, we, we all have both, but it's a little bit more towards the open-ended. Um, very different than say the 15 ISTPs and every single one of those ISTPs had more goal focus than open-ended. And you might think, well, ISTP, it, and are they supposed to be like perceiving and this and no, look at the functions, dominant thinking types. They're goal focused. But ENFP is a little bit more open-ended. Um, so what does that mean open-ended? More attention to seeking new input, ruminating about that input, reflecting on it, paying attention to process, engaging uh, to get more information. Less emphasis on focusing, filtering, and deciding. I think for many ENFPs, decision-making is not a happy place, um, especially on the fly. For the few subjects uh, where I gathered the 20th piece of data, it was right here in the center. And that's great, because that neat little place in the center there is this like self-manager, you know, like an emotional intelligence, like self-managing. And that's actually really strong for them. So I have this little theory, we're gonna see how it works out, that ENFPs seem like they're generalists and use all the parts of their brain reasonably equally. But there's this one little part, the goal-focused part, the self-manager part, not the goal-focused part, the self-manager part, that's like the one that's like, yeah, I got my stuff together. Everything's flying around me like a tornado, but I have my stuff together. And they just, they get through life that way. So I think that this is a nice little thing to know. We're not really surprised. We're seeing that like the data supporting our impression that ENFPs are like these open-ended folks. I'm gonna pick out four other regions that are more active for them. Statistically, meaningfully more active, because there's 42 of them and that's a lot of data. So we can pick out four and even if they're in the like 55, 60% range, Strong, reasonably strong, they're good. T6 is back here, this region like behind your right ear. What does that involve with? Noticing holistic visual patterns, um, paying attention to felt narrative, like you know parts of your life and memories that have emotional resonance to them. Um, decoding faces based on context. I always find that last one really interesting because um, what, what does that mean exactly? It doesn't mean I'm looking at you and seeing you have a frown and that means that you're unhappy. What it means is that you see your friend come into the room and you're like, I know that look. Whatever that look is on them, you know that look and you know what that means. 
That's an ENFP strength. Highly, so CZ is another PZ, so these are running in the middle of the brain. That corpus callosum, that, that part that brings the two sides of the brain together. Active, highly active mind and busy body. And in kids, it's associated with ADD, ADHD. Anybody have kids with ADD or ADHD? Yeah, okay. ENFPs, like, can, but hopefully they, they self-manage to make that useful as they get older, but they're still jumping up and down mentally. Um, visual kinesthetic understanding of a system. So PZ, it's a little bit further in the back. It brings in like vision and a little bit of space and also like physical sensation, a sense of like, this is how the system works. I can feel how it works and like sort of visualize it. And what are those elements and how is everything sort of flying together? And then finally, the one piece which, which is really consistent is this T4 region is by the ear, your right ear. And this is the part that helps with melody, voice tone, and intention. So you hear a melody, you hear a voice tone, which is not a melody, but you know, it's from spoken and it's not a song. And then there's intention. So if I say, I don't like you, and that, what does that mean? If you're really British, you have to listen really, really closely to know what that means, because it's just like a little like tilt in it. But for the most part, um, yeah, it was British, it means I hate you. But I would never say that, because if I said I hate you, that means I love you. Um, that's why it's really important to have this part of the brain, because you can't just rely on the words as how it's said. Um, and that region is also involved in managing some impulses, managing anger, managing loss. Um, and it's not a surprise because a lot of songs are about anger and loss, aren't they? Like the musician is horribly sad because they broke up or they're really angry because they broke up <laughs> or, you know, it's like though, not a surprise. Those things go together. So those are ENFP strengths. We see those were at least interests. Remember, I didn't say skill, but they're putting interest there. And eventually that means if it's not a skill, it's going to become a skill because they're pushing to put interest there. And then I asked, well, you know, there's a few other regions. I, I could go further down and look at, like, besides the top four, like the fifth one and the sixth one, like, what are those? And I found those were different depending on whether they were male or female ENFPs. I'm not talking about gender. I'm talking about, like, XX and XY chromosomes. Like, what are, are they? There's a little bit different, and they're almost equal in number. So for the women, we saw this appreciating visual beauty and noticing body language was in into where they were putting some interest and attention to social feedback and some factual detail stuff. So there's a stuff on the right and left side of the brain. And then for the male ENFPs, it was a little bit different, although th those were strong too, but it was a little bit, they favored a little bit more some regions involving visual precision. So not this like abstract, this is beautiful, but like cinematography, uh, maybe engineering, but I found generally more it's things like film, um, and photography that was like that part of the brain, just get visual precision, how many pixels. Um, and then P4, this region involved in working with multiple variables and visual spatial stuff. I think it's important to understand that this is statistical and that what we're going to see later is one, gender differences, the sex differences disappear after age 55, which is sort of neat. And the other thing is, is that your career can override what that is. So if you pick a career like your female ENFP and you become an engineer or a cinematographer or something, you're probably going to end up looking like a quote male ENFP, which basically means it doesn't really have any meaning except that, you know, sex is one part of it and career is another part and culture also is a part of it too. And then it all disappears with age anyway. <laughs> what about the least used regions? This is what I love, the least used regions are, are in the left hemisphere. So, you know, like left brain thinking, linear, logical, that kind of thing. Yeah, ENFP, right up in here, uh, linear, logical, deductive thinking. If A equals B and B equals C, then what? A equals C. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And just run your whole life like that. ENFP is like, nah, I don't think so. Um, mental, some mental planning is part of that. And then C3, this like precise body motion. I, I'm terrible at C3 too, by the way, because it's like, I, I can do the box step. That's about it. Okay, but then also, you know, it's like precision with your fingers. If you have, I've watched several ENFPs attempt to untie knots. That's a really funny uh, thing to watch. 
<laughs> if you've ever watched it, it's pretty humorous. I'm assuming there is, it's statistical though, remember, so there are probably some ENFPs who are amazing knot tires. But statistically speaking, not a strength. Um, and then memorizing by repetition. So that's also, that's, that's, these, are, these, are, these are not strong. Okay, they're not where the attention goes. Attention is not going to this. Any questions so far? Any thoughts come to mind? Yes. Well, part of the reason is the first intern I had who started cranking out this data had ENFP preferences. And I said, you can pick a type and don't pick one that only has like 10 people in it. And she's like, well, I'm an ENFP. I want to know about other ENFPs. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and I'm like, fair enough, because I want the interns to be happy interns so that I get more interns in the future. Because <laughs> these are like UCLA students. And the beautiful thing is, the students pay UCLA four and a half thousand dollars, which is the cost of a four unit course, to work for me for free. Like, what a genius. Like, I love it. Finally, I'm getting back pay that I should have gotten from like years ago, you know, because they pay faculty badly. So it's, I feel like now it's like a little bit of compensation. Any other thoughts or questions? Good, okay. So that's all just what's going on in the lab. And that gives a really nice view and that's often how brain research does. It stops at this point. It's gonna break it down a little bit more by age and so on, but I'm, I'm not gonna take you on that journey now because we're gonna do that in 15 minutes from now. Um, but this is a lot of times where it ends. Just, you know, they hope that we just threw enough stuff at you or made a generic open-ended enough experience that we've captured who you are. And it turns out this is a pretty good, this is a pretty, like it, it supports some ideas of how ENFPs, you know, are ideas about them that they pay attention to voice tone and intention and that they're energetic perhaps a little bit to the point of ADD. Uh, they also pay attention to body language. Um, some other stuff like that. Yes? One question is, have you found, do you show the data to the participants? Um, they do get a report afterwards. Receptive to it, or have you found any resistance to the information afterwards? Or are they like, oh yeah. Um, no, I think the only complaint I've ever gotten is like, could you have recorded it on video? Or like, do you have even more? I give them a 23 page report. But for some of them want more. Um, I think I give them an audio tour of the report too, so that they hear my voice explain each page. I don't record for every single person. I just record a generic thing and then tell them what to look for on their page. But um, no, no, I don't think so. Yeah, but I think that they know what they're getting when they come in. So it's not like some terrible surprise or something. And everybody is different. I would say the one quote disappointment that people have is there is invariably the person who comes in like we heard someone today, he's like, well, I thought I was an INTP, but now I'm thinking INTJ. Um, what type am I? Well, this brain scan is probably gonna show which type I am, right? And I'm like, eh, no. What it's gonna show is exactly why you can't figure out between those two. <laughs> That's what it's gonna show, because you're gonna show elements of both. Because every person, remember, every ENFP is like no other ENFP. And the same for INTP and INTJ and so on. So now we're gonna go in and we're gonna look at brain wiring and I'm gonna jump off from this point of male and female brains and then we're gonna leave that behind and go to some other stuff. But I'm gonna take a look at this idea of brain wiring. Which you're like, what? See, I look carefully, there's a test on it later. Um, the, the male ENFPs on aggregate are on the left and the, the female are on the right. They actually do look different. So this is a different technique. This is when the computer goes in. I can't see this visually watching the screen, you know, as they're doing the session. The computer does this analysis and it spits out these results. And then I get to draw the, the map from the results. And it is sort of neat to see that male and female ENFPs look different. But like I said, wait and watch, because by the time people are 55 and above, these disappear. Um, so it's really, this is only like an influence. It's an influence. But then there's this idea that we have these circuit diagrams. It's sort of like social network. Different parts of the brain fire at the same time. There's this idea deep in the brain that the part of the brain called the thalamus basically sends out some signals and say, hey, for this kind of situation, you need this part of the brain, which is over here, and you need this one, and you need this one. So like you three, like fire, because we need you right now. 
And then like one second later, it's like, no, 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 now it shifted. Like now we need you, you four over here, like you shift. So it's, it's, we have these networks in the brain. And these are the results long term. I mean, when I did this for the first time and I found networks and I thought some of these, wow, they go into the right hemisphere here. And like, what is this about? About like balance and body motion. And I'm like, oh yeah, because when I was six, seven, eight years old, I learned surfing, ice skating, skiing, roller skating, like all of this stuff. And even when I went ice skating again in my 20s, it had been like at least 15 years since I got ice skating, I didn't even fall down. I'm just like, oh, this, this is fun. Like this again, it was still in my brain at age 40 something. It was still there, like the capacity for that. Um, not the only part of the brain involved with balance, uh, but that's it's sort of neat to see that there are things from your childhood which will still be there. And pursuant to something that somebody asked earlier about negative memories, yes, skills that you learned that were coping mechanisms, maybe for negative experiences, will still potentially be in your brain and still firing maybe 10 times every second. Or maybe they're very slow and they only fire once every two minutes, but they're still there. That's some, one of the things that people I find very interesting. It's like, what is this about? And they, really what it is is they, they see, I point out there's a line here and, and I'm like, I, I'm not really sure what this is about. And they're like, well, tell me. And I tell them what those two brain regions do that are linked together. And they're like, oh, I know exactly what that's about. And I've heard some really interesting stories about that. So some of the things that we learn sort of going deep down uh, is that brain wiring supports intuiting and feeling preferences. We see which parts of the brain are wired and which ones aren't, and we see those support intuiting and feeling preferences. Um, both female and male ENFPs show skills to analyze others. ENFPs are a little, females are a little bit better at, at, at attending to, or the, better I mean that they have more brain wiring around voice, tone, and intention. Male ENFPs a little bit more around attending to body language and like the visual skills. And we know in the general population, for whatever reason, doesn't matter whether it's genetic or environmental or whatever reasons, men are a little bit more visual, women are a little bit more auditory, statistically speaking, which doesn't say anything about individuals, but statistically speaking. And then these sex differences, auditory versus visual, is sort of classic, we can sort of see this. It might explain, if you look on the MBTI, it says that introverts and thinking types are more visual and extroverts and feeling types are more auditory. So what, what impact is it gonna have when somebody takes the MBTI instrument? And invariably you'll encounter people who have. Maybe a male ENFP is going to be pegged as a thinking type or more of an introvert, when in fact they just, their brain is wired in a slightly different way that has nothing to do with, you know, whether they're an ENFP or not. Female ENFPs, oh, really great. They show this, so we're gonna break it down. Strong whole brain pattern. So one of the strongest of all of the 16 types. What does whole brain pattern mean? It means all the regions are firing simultaneously. They see, oh, a puppy, and like every single thing goes off in the brain. <laughs> or they're like, ooh, business deal. Everything goes off in the brain all at once whether they seem like they're related or not. But the beauty of that is even if it seems like it's unrelated, it doesn't matter because maybe there is a relationship in there. And thank goodness some part of the brain that normally wouldn't be associated with it, it actually fires up. I just recently did an assessment for an ENTJ who was severely jet lagged. So different type, ENTJ. And he had four hours sleep and he came in and except for one part of his brain up on the front, the self-management, it was like crickets. <laughs> there was nothing going on in the brain, nothing. And then finally we did some stuff like, like okay, let's do some, so we're gonna break out of the usual thing because it's like your brain is asleep. He didn't seem like he was asleep, but he's like his brain is asleep. And finally he did some social interaction with a potential new client. I'm like, just pick up your phone and like do something right now. And the brain, like two or three regions lit up and that was it. And then he hangs up the phone and they, they go down again, they're very quiet. And then he's like, am I brain dead or something? And I'm, like, <laughs> and I'm like, one, you're tired. And two, your brain is very efficient. Your brain is very efficient. ENFP does not have efficient brain, but they get benefits from that because maybe something comes up. Ooh, puppies and business deals. Ooh, I could see a whole business opportunity there. 
And let me tell you, where I live in Los Angeles, there are so many places to take care of your dog and your cat, usually not together in the same place. Um, somebody found a business model there, and good for them. Um, highly auditory, both word use and voice tone, which impacts a wide variety of other skills, making analogies, telling stories, um, a bit more reflective than their male counterparts. There are these parts of the brain and the back information comes in and it like connects down into like the limbic system and memory, hippocampus. Um, so before acting on new input, female ENFP is a little bit more likely than their male counterparts to ruminate on something. Better than average awareness of body language, but rely, again, more on voice tone. And the male ENFPs, it pretty much is supporting what we saw. Like, it's not a huge divergence. So this is good. This is good to know. Whole brain pattern, it doesn't, they have it, but it doesn't show up on the diagram. It's not as strong. Instead, they have five different regions of the brain that are like sort of diagonal. It looks, I don't know exactly what they're doing. It's sort of diagonal. And they just work as like a, what is it called? If you have a trio that's three and you have a quartet that's four, quintet, right? Yeah, it's a quintet of brain regions that work together, like singing and dancing. It's not the whole thing, it's those five. Um, and it's really about goal-focused brainstorming mode with some visualization. And they're really good at, at thinking based on induction. So it's not like everything acting at once. It's like, hmm, you know, it's like thinking in terms of analogies. If this is like that, and this other relationship is like this other thing, then, ooh, this could be true. Let me check it out and see what that is. That's why the activity you did earlier today where you went back into the past and thought about something and it's like, did you notice a pattern there? Is that pattern playing out in your life right now? There's some pattern recognition and there's some induction because you have to ask, like, is that pattern playing out now? How is it going? What is it like? Um, they're pretty good. They're, they're, they have good goal-focused visual analytical skills. It means that on typically male ENFPs, you can sit them down and like, here's a computer or like, here's some photography, and they'd be like, oh, I'm interested in that. Like, let me figure out some details. But again, this is just statistical, and this is what I started with. So I'm taking you on a little bit of a journey because we're going to see maybe this is not so important after all. And then there's some other stuff that's going on there. Uh, one thing I thought was interesting is male ENFP brains are a little bit faster than their female counterparts as they get older, like 55 plus. I'm like, is that an artifact? Or like, what's going on with that? But then the bonus is that ENFP females live longer, right? <laughs> so this is what I started with. And this is like a very sort of like basic way of breaking things down and trying to get a sense of what's going on. And it's telling the story that they're using brain regions and they've developed brain regions that make sense with their type that people develop and use parts of their brain that meet their psychological needs as well as their practical needs. We're hearing about these brain regions that are like, oh yeah, like induction, like this whole brainstorm kind of mode. They're more open-ended, they're paying attention to people-oriented things like voice tone and intention as well as body language. That doesn't mean they're completely that way because remember I mentioned some like self-reflection stuff and some visual precision. Like there's some others could be opposite type potential that's there. That's what took me to this idea of looking at careers. Because I've always been asking since 2006, what do you do? What have you been doing? The students, they're like, well, I'm cognitive science major. That's all. I don't know. What else? And I have to, you know, prod to find out what else they do. And I'm like, you came to UCLA and I'm sure like you put everything that you spent five minutes in on your resume. So like what else do you do? Um, and then we find out that they do photography and they work for the school newspaper and they were in theater and like all of this stuff. So I, I looked at art, business, people helping professions, which you could call like humanities in the general sense, uh, science and technology, it's like STEM kind of stuff, and then other. One ENFP just defied categorization. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't even remember what his story was, but he just like defied categorization. But they pretty much there was a lot of them. ENFPs like help people helping professions. And ENFPs like being artists. And actually a fair number go into business too. And then even a fair surprising number go into science and technology. Like working with stuff technically. So that was sort of neat to see. And it also helped me understand, I wanted to know, are the results that we saw biased before, male and female, because of the professions they're in? 
And if we look and we see, we're like, yeah, there's a lot of female ENFPs who are in the people helping professions compared to the males. So maybe that's what's influencing their attention to voice tone and intention and all of that. So that's a very important step to take. You can't just like divide it there and say, oh, that's it. You know, because there's the profession that they've been doing for five years, 20 years, whatever it is, that can have a huge impact. Also, large number of male ENFPs in the arts. But when you look in the arts, they're usually visual media and they're things like film. Any male ENFPs? Who are the male ENFPs here? You have any interest in film, making films ever happen? Okay, yeah. So there's uh, invariably somewhere in the ENFP's history, there was like a love affair at some point with film or photography or something like that. And then many of them, they take, that becomes a business thing. It becomes part of their career. So I had to be aware that there are like these biases in the data set. And, um, you know, I also have ENFP's do all of these different tasks meditation and math problems. By the way, nobody likes the math problems, really. Like, almost nobody. There's a few. I bet I even had an INTJ come in, age 30. He was a math major. And he also was like, oh, no, I forgot how to do math. <laughs> and he's like, can I stop now? And he got really upset about it. Because, like, you get a Bachelor of Science in math, and then you don't remember how to do, like, differentiation or an integral. And he's like, oh! Uh, so he was very embarrassed. So nobody likes that. Um, risk and uncertainty with money. Everybody loves risk and uncertainty with money, right? <laughs> so uh, drawing, that's a more thing. Expert talk. People love talking about what they know. Um, how do ENFPs respond to these tasks? Meditation. I think this is, a, this is an interesting thing. So I, um, I, I know a number of ENFPs, of course, the younger ones I've met who like hate meditation. But then when I talk to older ones, They've gone and done like Vipassana for a week and they're like, it was the most horrible, difficult thing I've ever done and it was totally worth it. And, and so I'm like, okay, okay, that's good. 80% could quiet their, their, their brain and get sort of body connected, and which is like most people, and then 20% found it hard. So actually ENFPs, you know what? Meditation is actually not harder for you than it is for other people. You're like right in line with everybody else. Um, which is, it's, it's not as bad as you think. Like, people can do it. Math, 40% of them, their brain got busy. They're like, yeah, I'm going to try these problems. 30% uh, found it easy, and 30% really got emotional and stressed about it. And that didn't matter if they were male or female. They got stressed about it. Um, career, even then. I think Americans just don't like math for some reason. Uh, verbal creativity. And this is, a, this is the kind of thing, okay, this is where ENFPs are going to shine, and it's so true. So I'm going to, who's an ENFP here? ENFP? Okay. One, and then who's another? Another, will you, okay. Well, there's, oh, yes, excellent. So I'm going to call upon you, if I could. So I'm going to give you a, a word, and I'd like you to use it in a sentence. Like, it just like a normal sentence. This is like a practice. So like cell phone. Perfect. Okay, now I'm going to give you another word, and I want you to do the same thing. Philosophy oven. What's your philosophy of the I'll give you a moment. Philosophy oven. Philosophy oven is that one worth one? You think of it as a word. It's a thing, yeah. Uh, maybe Sears has them 20% off this week. <laughs> I'd like to learn more about it. There you go. Would, would, would personality hacker perhaps function at times as a philosophy oven? Yeah, it does, doesn't it? Yeah, it's a micro, and you know, because uh, whenever you have an ENTP or something, you remember, it's not, it's not like a coal fire, it's like a microwave. Bzzz, and you're like going around really fast, and you're going to get cooked. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so that, no, ENFPs found that, half of them found it really easy and engaging, and I, I would say that's not typical for people. Okay, because they like this, like playing with them. Maybe INTP also thinks this is really cool, but this is like an NP activity. Uh, then I gave them an ethics thing. And they say, they get a scenario, and then what would you do? And it's like, it's not easy. And they were, half of them were really relaxed about it. They were interested, but they were very relaxed. Yeah, I would do this, and I wouldn't do that. And why is that? Well, you know, because. And they like, snap, 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 like right away. They're the same on the ENFJ, INFJ, they go right away. Oh, to give like some of those ethics problems to like some other types. Hmm. Um, some of them get very creative though with ethics. 
you, you know, <laughs> um, I don't mean the ENFPs, they're just people in general. Um, and then giving an expert talk, uh, ENFPs were really engaged in giving an expert talk. I think, you know, it's just like, it's like, oh, thank goodness, I can talk about anything I want to. I'm going to just, we're just going to like chat. And invariably, the expert talk would turn into a chat and like a Q&A and a dialogue. So this is important. Like I give them all these activities. I want to know what excites their brains. And some of them are the things that are true for everybody and other things like verbal creativity and ethics problems that they actually found much easier. Some people get really stressed out by the ethics situation. Some people, can you imagine, and I've given this to like an, an ISFJ, and I ask them, I'd like you to use the phrase, uh, and then I give something weird like philosophy of him, or even an ENTJ. ENTJ, my, the, the very typical answer they give is, that's not a real thing. <laughs> an ENTJ, because they, you know, they're going to have, like, because remember, intuiting is auxiliary. And they're just like, what? You're trying to get me to do extroverted intuiting. Like, I don't want to do that. But if I keep pushing, eventually they will. Um, so the, when I sorted them by career, I came, I also did, found brain wiring in two categories. And basically, the people on the left uh, are the ones in business and STEM stuff. And the people on the right are in the arts and humanities and, and like something physical. And they look almost identical to the male and female ones, except that they're not actually sorted that way because there are lots of male ENFPs who are in the arts, and so they should be like on the right, except the average male ENFP is one on the left. And I thought, well, this is really strange. I'm like, okay, so there's like maybe two subtypes of each type. That's what I'm thinking. And like sex plays one role, but like career plays another role, and it seems like the career can override the sex factor. Uh, that's sort of like my, my what hypothesis I had, and I hadn't looked at age yet. So there was like a little bit of a mystery there. I also tried to sort into more categories, but I found I didn't need to. Basically, there were these two that came out as interesting, like these clumps. So STEM and business on the one side, and then like basically either you run Google or you work as like a you know, digital slave at Google, but same idea. Or on the right, you're like, uh, you know, marketing and psychology and maybe something physical and then that's those are sort of the I'm like okay but this is so odd because I, I know like what's going on I'm thinking so some career insights before I untangled that I just looked at career and by the way I'm, I'm looking here instead of there because I can't actually read that clearly so and if I can't I'm guessing that you all the way back there yes you're good okay excellent um, so career category shows uh, less, slightly less clear impact than sex because I'm not quite sure how it's working. So that was my like, hypothesis or like my conclusion so far. Then this could be due to the wide variety of career skills because a person who's like in man business management, like maybe that's really people oriented and it's that what they're doing is not actually so businessy after all in a technical sense. So maybe I didn't categorize people the best way. Um, Nonetheless, the details of the career often show up for individuals. When I would get down to lab, so, so I have somebody come in, and she was debating between ISFP and ISTP, um, or INFJ. And I'm like, hmm. And then I think ultimately, like two years later, she, set, later, she settled on INTJ. <laughs> so she comes in, and I'm like, well, you know, tell me about yourself. And she says, well, I think I'm an ISFP. Those are my preferences. And I said, well, why are you thinking ISTP? And she's like, well, she's like, I work in a lab as a lab technician with other people. And she's like, so I feel like I have these technical skills and I do this problem solving stuff. So I'm wondering, like, is that my career or is that really my interest? And I said, okay, now tell me about INFJ. And she said, well, with INFJ, I feel like they have this creative and intuitive side and they're also people people and that they're introverts. I'm like, that, that resonates for me. I'm like, okay, so I can, and she's like, an INFJ also has like introverted thinking as something that they develop. And so maybe that maybe that's what I'm using in the lab. I'm like, okay, those are good points. So we went through and we did the brain imaging and she got her results and I'm like, yeah. So she's like, well, which type do I look like? And I said, well, you look like either ISFP with like a lot of technical skills or you're ISTP with some really great people skills or you're an INFJ except you don't have this usual like whole brainstorm pattern that most INFJs do. I'm like, I'm sorry, but that's how you came out. No wonder you're debating between those three types because that's what we see. The, the career, so we see exactly that. I even had one, he came in, he's an ESTP, and he looked very typically like ESTP, except he had one link that was from like here 
running back through here, like very unusual, kind of really strong. And he's like, well, what? and I, I mean, he knew type, and, and he was like, well, what does that mean? And, and I'm like, well, I don't know exactly, but I'll tell you what the two regions involved. They said, this one has been associated with values and beliefs and religiosity, like and dislike. And then this other region back here is involved with weighing multiple variables at once, like risk and uncertainty, like looking at things from different perspectives. We know this from economics and neuroeconomic studies. And, uh, and he said, oh, he says, no, that makes perfect sense. He said, because I, I did my own major in college and it was on um, like the sociology of uh, religion. So he's like looking at like why people have different value systems and different beliefs and like exploring that analytically. And then what he's been doing for so many years, he just flies around the country and gives talks on like values and beliefs and religion and like, but analyzing from like a thinking perspective. He's like, well, people see things this way and like, or you could see them this way. And, and he's like, no, that makes perfect sense for me. And then, and then the good news is I picked, he's like, that's so amazing you picked that out from me. Is like that, that would just be, and so I've heard from him again, you know, busy ESTP, but he remains impressed. Um, so sometimes you really can zero in on that. Um, science, technology, business suggests better skills in areas like math, reading, speaking, goal focused brainstorming. So you can be, do goal focused brainstorming. That was something that came up today, wasn't it? So there could be like open ended, extroverted intuiting. It's like, ooh, there's baloney raining from the sky. And then there's like goal-focused brainstorming, where it's like, we need to come up with a solution for this, let's do a brainstorming session. And I don't mean like a boring corporate brainstorming session, like genuinely thinking outside the box, but with a goal focus. Um, and then the arts and humanities and the physical people uh, showed stronger whole brain creative mode, where their whole brain comes into play and gets active. And, and it's like, oh, we can use a little of this and a little of this. And you know what? No one is going to expect that we're going to bring in this other thing over here. And then they're really going to remember us. And, and that's really, really, and that could be the same. My, uh, my first, my, my sister has ENFP preferences and I think she's okay if I tell the story. And um, she had to do, to get her social welfare degree, she had to do an internship. She had to do three of them. Her first internship was working at the prosecutor's office in Philadelphia. The philosophy they have at the prosecutor's office is this. You know the difference between uh, the victim and the accused? The accused is the one who fired his gun faster. The victim was simply slower in firing his gun. And so she was, what was her job? Her job was, now mind you, she's like, what is it, she five foot? How tall is she, mom? Five two, she's five foot two, and she's like, I don't know, 24 years old at the time, this skinny blonde girl, and she goes in, and she has to go into a room with like a six foot four African American guy who's from the hood, and convince him to rat on his friends and cooperate with the government. <laughs> but she's an ENFP. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> And her supervisor said, I thought you would come out crying on the first day and we would not see you again. And that's not what happened. Her very first person, yep, she got him to turn. ENFPs just bring in that magic from some part of the brain. You don't know where that comes from. They don't know where it comes from either, but it's coming in. It's like every instrument in the orchestra is playing and something's going to work. So they have that whole brain creative mode. They're a little bit more generalist. Um, and that's the things that I saw with ENFPs. I'm like, okay, that's really cool. And as I delved in, of course, I wanted to highlight, and again, memorize these diagrams, um, <laughs> that these are people, male, female, of different ages, different backgrounds, and it, it, it's a nice mix of things. Because it shows you that there's still a bit of variety and you could have somebody Again, like you see, like, oh yeah, that sex thing, like that's only true in the aggregate, aggregate because we have this person here. Um, let's see, this, the two males right on the left, and they have this whole brainstorm pattern, and one of them has an MBA, but he's also organizational trainer. So in fact, he, like, his actual job is to teach type. Um, and then the other one is a graphic artist and a former lawyer. He did law because he was like, oh, that's different, and I get to like, get up really early in the morning 
And, and he was in Britain, so he was a, um, not a solicitor, but um, barrister. And he got to wear a wig and everything, so it was really cool. And after like two years of that, he's like, okay, that I'm done. Um, and, and both of them have that whole brainstorm pattern there. So it really, was, you wanna get in and see what skills are the person using, how is that shaping their brain day in and day out. And remember that just because something is true in the aggregate, you, aggregate, you still have the individual underneath. Before we wrap up the story, I wanna tell you though about age because age is the really, really cool part that comes in. How do ENFP brains change with age? So we have three brains here. We have the young'uns on the left, ages 15 to 25. Um, the, those subject numbers are a little bit smaller than, the, they're bigger now, this is from before. Uh, then we have 25 to 55, which is sort of broad, and then we have 55 plus. And we, we notice that there's this, like, they're shipped, they look different. Oh, that's all you need to see is that they look different. And what's important to notice is that the third one is actually a combination of the first two in many ways. The third one, which is age 55 plus, not only is a combination of the other two, but it's also a combination of the male and female brains and the ones that were like the STEM business people and the arts and humanities people. And it didn't matter what profession they were. I noticed, I noticed that there's uh, on the one on the left and one on the right. There's a horizontal line. Yes. In the middle one. In the middle one, it seems to have broken. Um, oh, right across the the the, the very center. Like from temple to temple. Oh, from temple to temple. Oh no, it, it's there. It just doesn't show up well. But they're all they're all red lines. All three at the top. Oh, right. Yeah, and oh, the red line. No, 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 no. Right up here. Oh, the temple one. Um, yeah, they go from black. It, there actually is, but it's like gray. Yeah, I just wondered, yeah, I just wondered why the... Uh, some of that could just be, well, yes. Um, so I have, uh, we did, I, I did work with a group of people. We did brain imaging for 65 high school students at a private school in Florida. Um, we know that when you look at kids, like certainly before age 25 and definitely before 20, that the prefrontal region of the brain, those executive regions are not done forming yet. In fact, they're, they're like in the middle of forming at best. So you're not going to see a strong connection there between these very, very front ones. Instead, going between here and here where you see the extra activity and the connection is actually in the temple regions connecting to each other. And so it could be that there's like in the young ones, I'm not surprised to see that because those two regions tend to be more active as teenagers and then the activity and connectivity shift more towards like the very front in adults. Um, and then in the older ones, it's still mostly in the front. I, that may be it. Yeah, I, that's a good question. I haven't exactly, but that would sort of be my, I'd start investigating that, yeah. Yeah, I mean, and that, that's, that's something really to appreciate is teenagers' brains are not wired like adults' brains. Really, they aren't. And even kids, like I don't even work with kids because I have to take like a whole special class to understand how their brains are different and, and even get the kids to sit still um, and, and go through all of this process. Um, but what's really neat is not only do we see that the older brains, 55 plus, have elements of both and of also just, you know, doesn't matter male or female, they've also just absorbed all the different patterns in one place. So that does mean, and, and I've worked with Linda Behrens for years, who was this, you've probably heard of David Kiersey, temperaments and ideal, or artisan, guardian, idealist, rational. So she was a student of, of his um, and longtime member of the type community for decades, since like the early 70s. And she, she now works with top like corporate people. And she's like, those people, most of them are 55 plus, And it's really hard to get them to do type identification. Because they read something and they're like, well, uh, I identify with all of these things. And then you, she, she's like, has to rewind them. Remember when you were a teenager? Like, what was that like? Or when you were in your 20s? Like, what kind of issues were you grappling with? So I'm not surprised. So what is really neat when we sum it up is we see, and I think this makes sense because it, some of you might vaguely remember when you're teenagers that like hormones play a role. So we, and we know those hormones affect the brain as well as the body. 
Those seem to play a role when people are younger. So you have differentiation between male and female. Then career comes in, five years, 10 years, 20 years of practicing a career, and the career makes a big impact and can shift and reorganize everything. And then finally, in that 55 plus, so that's post midlife, then there's this convergence where that stuff doesn't seem to matter as much. And there's just like, I am the Zen ENFP. <laughs> And that's, again, statistical, so that's no guarantee for the particular ENFPs in the room. But it is why I said, if we want to talk about personality, I believe we need to talk about development. And that the person you're interviewing and you're trying to profile them, what is their career? It was going to have a big impact on the skills that they have and their sort of evaluation of where they put their attention, which is going to influence their answers. Their age is going to have an impact. So if they're 60, very different than when they're 20. Not just because of life experience or whatnot, but their brains actually work differently. Um, also, as people get older, their brain is slower. And so please, for those of you who, who have, probably a lot of you have parents who are like getting a little bit on, the average speed for somebody 15 to 25 is like, one half second to maybe one and a half seconds. Let's just say one second. There's a thought, the fastest thought is every second. You want chocolate, vanilla, or, or strawberry ice cream? Oh, strawberry. Okay, then when you get to like adult adults, like age 35, 45, 50, they're like, chocolate, vanilla, or strawberry? A chocolate. There's just like a very slight delay, but it's fine. You know, you're driving along, it's fine. Then you get to like the 65 plus, would you like chocolate, vanilla, or strawberry ice cream? One, one thousand, two, one thousand, three, one thousand, strawberry. And, but that doesn't have to be that way. But again, there's these, I, I, the psychiatrist, uh, I worked with ENTJ, and he's 62 at the time or something. His brain speed was still like a college student. Um, so it's uh, those kinds of things are also going to affect the person's presentation and how they think and what they do. So we normally think of extrovert intuiting as like, oh, really fast and like have all these ideas and floating around. The older ENFP is gonna be a little bit more like taking it easy and their brain's processing stuff and just because they're older. There's gonna be some of that. Um, lots and lots of insights by age, but I already mentioned all of these things. Um, some hypotheses from ENFP development, yeah, from teen to elder, they grow into their type preferences. So they, they don't necessarily, they don't stop being their type, but that whether they, they did this career or that career, whether they were male or female, those things seem to disappear, but the essence of their type remains. This whole brain pattern becomes actually more dominant. The skills of like voice tone, body language, all of that is still present. Um, they also get better at integrating perceiving and judging functions, which I see as being the left and right prefrontal parts of the brain. Um, I see with age, there's a little bit more of movement towards stuff involved with the back of the brain, which is associated generally in neuroscience with more, in, more introverted. So there's a little bit more introversion going on. Um, may look a little bit more like a thinking type, maybe a little bit more set in their ways because that stuff in the back of the brain also goes down and links into memory. Um, Male-female differences and variations by career categories tend to converge or integrate into single pattern. And then we have questions. Yes. Did you, and I'm not sure if you put that yet, but did you see at any point in time where the integration really starts to happen in terms of age, like 20, 40, 60? No, and you know, and I talked to a colleague of mine, Mina, and she was like, yeah, break it down by every 10 years or so. So I'm like, okay, when I reanalyze the data, I'll do every 10 years to see that where that is. All I can say right now is the 55 plus, but you're right, it could be lower or there could be some point like at 40 or whatever it is that's like the turning point. And I, I don't know exactly, yeah. That is on the to-do list, yes. Uh, I'm curious if there's any correlation between specific parts of the brain with a particular cognitive function? No, I, I would say, okay, so here's an example. This, this region, F7, so this is your left temple region. What is involved with? Well, as you go from the front more towards the ear, what it's associated with varies a little bit. It starts up here being about working memory. 
Then it develops what are called, you have mirror neurons. Mirror neurons allow you when you're watching somebody, say swing a tennis racket, it's been years since I swung a tennis racket, but we'll pretend. Okay, swinging a tennis racket, and you imagine that you're them and that you could do that. So learning by observation. Then you go a little bit further and you're like, you know what, I don't need to, I can just imagine them. So like I'm imagining my mom right now swinging a tennis racket, even though I've never actually saw you swing a tennis racket, but I can use my imagination. It's part of my working memory and I'm doing sort of a what if. Then it would be like, okay, let's go a little bit step uh, further away from that. So I'm like walking through the Renaissance and like, mm, there's some delicious roasted boar. And, and there's like some like, you know, some celery with it and sort of the activity where you did where you imagined a world. And then as it get towards the ear, it goes to this part with analogies. So it's like, uh, what is it? Um, cars are to roads as boats are to water. And those actions are all related to each other. So like in order to imagine me in the Renaissance, I need to think like, let's see, modern Dario is to Italian Renaissance Dario, conveniently same name, um, as a modern supermarket is to Renaissance outdoor marketplace. So mentally I have to engage, because my brain is generating something, it doesn't generate it out of thin air. Like it has to go through an, an analogical process. And I'm imagining Dari was like some other person a little bit different than me in the same way that I'm learning, you know, and watching somebody and learning from that. It's the same area of the brain. Now, if I were to ask which function is that associated with, first of all, I'm gonna tell you that the folks who have that more active tend to be extroverted intuiting or extroverted sensing, also some extroverted feeling, not extroverted thinking. But which part is what? So like ESFP is like, ooh, it's like they just watch somebody else swing a tennis racket and then they start swinging. You know, I watched one time as my, not my mom, but my stepmom, my dad's second wife. Um, I don't even know the circumstances of how this happened, but somehow she ended up at the wheel of a big rig. She has no experience driving a big rig. And she started driving it and like turning it. And the guys afterwards are like, you're a natural. She's like, how, they're like, how did you do this? And she's like, I don't know. I just like was watching what you all did and I play with the controls and it, it went and it worked. So that's a more like the sensing version. The introverted intuiting version, maybe some extroverted intuiting is like, oh, I'm in the Renaissance and da, da, da. I think the extroverted intuiting version is more like I'm imagining what you would do in that situation. And I saw that very clearly one day I had a student, this was years ago, this was like 2007, right, like right after I'd gotten started. And she's ENFP preferences, Jackie. And she's sitting there and we're between activities. And her brain is like right active, like right here, nothing else, just like right here. And I'm like, what, what, what is she doing? Like she's just sitting there. Like is, is she watching me? Like what, what is she doing? And I'm like, she's not even really looking at me. Like where is she looking at? It seems like we're in a library, basically, like a private anthropology library. And I asked her, what are, you, what are you thinking about? And she says, I'm watching that couple over there on the other side of the library, and I'm imagining what kind of interaction they're having. And that's, that was an example using that region, but using it in a way that met extroverted intuiting needs and interests rather than introverted intuiting or extroverted sensing. And so it's not a simple like idea of correlation. It's more like you have this toolbox and for the convenience, we'll say you have 20 very different tools and you develop the tools that help you meet your needs. And so the behavior on the surface could look one way, but the tools you're using are different or you could be using the same brain region, but it's the same thing going on. And I, I see it with math even. This is very, you know, the brain is actually not wired for math. Like you're not born with the ability to do math. You have to learn it. It's very unnatural for the brain. Um, and people use different parts. And if you use this part over here, you're probably pretty good at math. If you use both sides over here in the back, you're probably amazing at math. And if you use this part over here, you're probably terrible at math. And that's sort of the way it goes. But people use different parts. And I would say we end up using the regions that meet our needs. And that's, and so the, the, the functions, as Jung said, are context and like they're independent. So one ENFP can be a painter and the other one could be a psychologist and to them they're doing the same thing. But they're using different parts of the brain to do it. 
Other questions? Yes. So I think you said in the past that you found statistically significant correlations with all of the cognitive functions. Uh, have you seen some of the cognitive functions show up the most well, I haven't, you know, I just started getting into reanalyzing the data all over again now that I have over 300 people. I would say there are some regions like this FZ region in the front here, which is involved with induction and hypothesizing. I mean, that's what the literature calls it out as. Like, that's pretty much like intuiting folks. And that's, so that's one of those things. But I would say more often than not, the read, they seem to correspond to every region helping with two, maybe three of the different functions, depending upon how it's used. And it's a challenge because like somebody could have really high attention to melody because they were a musician and they were trained that way. So I think it's, you know, as opposed to just being somebody who was born with that skill. And that's, um, so I would say there are some regions that are like pretty clearly show with certain things, especially in the left hemisphere, the stuff with like linear planning, mental planning. But even the ENFP who was formerly a lawyer and he would wear a wig and this and that, still in his left hemisphere, he had all these connections. They weren't strong, they were like medium. But this really looked like, I'm like, what's going on here? He's got a little inner ESTJ. And you know, he worked on the inner ESTJ when he was like 25 instead of waiting until 55 when he had that. So that's sort of the way I would describe it. Is like looking at a collection of skills and asking like what type needs do those meet? And, and I think that's fairly easy. You can look at a person's results and you would say like, do these mostly meet like intuiting needs or sensing needs? In the aggregate, as a pattern, do these mostly meet feeling or, or thinking, you know, tasks? And people can say like, oh, this mostly meets like intuiting. And then second, they're like, I could see thinking, but also there's some feeling there. Um, and it's just overall, as you look at like 20, you look at the palette of, of how they've developed, as opposed to like trying to match it like one to one or something, which is a little, only in a few cases. So this is a more general question, but would you say that your research is helping to empirically support Myers Briggs at all? Um, well, I would say the most definitive things to support Myers-Briggs was the Minnesota study on identical twins. And I don't think anybody can really beat that um, in terms of validity. So the, this is a longitudinal study, genetic study on identical twins raised separately. And you can find this on the internet, um, just Minnesota twin study, MBTI. And you'll see that all of the MBTI dimensions have 40 to 60% correspondence with the twins. I mean, you know, in other words, a genetic component. Um, and that was, even though they were raised separately and, and so on. So that right away that says, and the, the E and I dimension is very similar to like five factor model extroversion trait also has the same impact. So I would say that the identical twins raised separately, like that's a really big piece in terms of validation. I think what I'm bringing is I'm really trying to distinguish that there's like a skills level and then there's like mental process or psychological processes. And I'm saying the whole thing is a little bit more complicated than we thought. Jung would have loved it though, because Jung would be like, oh, it's all about development. <laughs> and that's what I would say the story is. The good news is I would say clearly people tend to develop and use the parts of the brain that are meeting, their, that correspond to their type needs. Like when we looked at those very first slides and we saw ENFPs tend to prefer these four regions and they're really low on these two regions, I'm like, that's so like, that matches ENFP. So it lends support for sure. I wouldn't say it's the biggest piece of support. What I say is that the neuroscience really enriches our understanding of type as development. Have you noticed if left-handedness affects the way a type shows up? The way a type shows up, no. In some way. Yes. Um, I have two responses to that. One is for a long time I avoided using left-handed people because everything in the literature, including the neuroscience, lab did EEG at UCLA, they're like, we don't even allow lefties beyond this point. No, there's a sign that says no lefties beyond this point. <laughs> then, then uh, I'm not kidding. And then, then I went to Arizona State University and I talked with somebody who did EEG and leadership stuff and he was also interested in type. And he's like, I include left-handed people all the time. It's like, it doesn't really make any big difference. Just their favorite regions are gonna be a little bit more active in the right hemisphere than the left hemisphere. But he's like, but I don't think the brain is usually that different between us. 
you know, left and, and right people. So there seems to be that, that it actually doesn't make much of a difference. And I don't have a huge number of left-handed people, so, and I haven't cranked out the numbers. What I can say, though, is that whole brain pattern, that starburst pattern that's associated with like creativity and all this stuff activating at once, who does it show up for? It shows up for three groups of people in general over, over the whole database. One is people with strong intuiting preference. The second group is people in the creative arts. And the third group is left-handed sensing types. Not left-handed intuiting types, left-handed sensing types. And that's, those are the three groups that I've seen this. So that's what I would say is the broad answer. Yes? Uh, I was, uh, was going to ask a quick question, but I think we also want to ask a couple questions. Sure, yeah. Unless there's, I know there's probably, who, just raise your hand if you have a question. So one, two, three, four, five. We'll hold it up to you for more questions too. Then we'll want to do that. Okay, so those five people, we shoot them and then we bring you up. Is that the, yes, no. Why don't we do a transition? Because I know we'll do some of the. We do, yes. Perfect, yes. Because again, I want to be mindful of your time, but we also love having you here. Oh, thank you. Yeah, 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 yeah. So this is like a mini panel? Yeah, how do you, well, how do you want to do this part? Do you want to demonstrate at all? I do, no, I can demonstrate, but I think we're going to do like a little pee break. That's what I was That's originally great. That's thinking. What I think it'd be a great idea. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it will take a few minutes to make that work. And cool. I think I can safely sit now. All right, for a cool. Moment. Well, then do you want to break now and then come back and do that? Would no, that let's do the questions while they're on people's yeah. minds. All right. Let's yes. Do that. Okay. I just didn't know how you wanted to play it. That's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And while they're doing it, I'll, ask, I'll answer your question while we're waiting for yeah, them to do. organize. Yes. I noticed, I noticed on the slides you went through really fast, it was on the ones about age. There was a note about like visual ability decreases yeah. with yeah. age. Yeah. And it got me thinking about like, well, like people's, like, people's eyesight decreases with age. So I was wondering, like, in your study at all, or even hypothetically, mm. out of the, like, the studies that you've done, do you notice adaptations in the way the brain works based on maybe physical? Differences. Mm. So, if like, if there's a type that is like, like, uh, female ENFPs are more sensitive to all personality. Right, right. So, right. would a hearing impaired female ENFP be adaptation? Absolutely, I, I'm sure. Like, and I'm not saying that from my own research; it's just reading in general. We know that people are going to try and work around something that would be a disability, including the, like damage from a stroke. Um, absolutely, if they're deaf or they're blind, whatever it is, yeah, people will work around that. When I talk about decrease in vision ability, is that there are these two regions in the back of the brain that are involved with vision. It's pretty big, and they need to coordinate with each other, you know, like left and right field of view. So when you're driving, you need to coordinate these fields of view. Normally, in, in most people, I mean, pretty much everybody under age 55 or 60, those go really fast. They communicate some of the fastest parts of the brain. Because otherwise, you can be like, do, 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 and something's coming along, and you get hit, because you don't even see it. But the speed tends to decrease with age. And I have seen people, and it isn't always because of age. So I had somebody come in and he had poor connectivity there and he's really strongly dyslexic. So it can be something, it can be like there's some other vision issue the way it shows up. It isn't just like you shouldn't be driving. Um, similar, people who are older can still have a strong connection and maybe decreased eyesight could contribute to lack of coordination. Also things like Parkinson's, absolutely Parkinson's, especially earlier stages disrupts the firing in the brain so the person looks slower because they're waiting for like a good connection to happen. They keep missing each other. So there's a variety of things that it's involved with, yeah. Do you think a brain would adapt over time? Like if, if vision decreases with the brain then change more dialogues or would there just be kind of like a Well, the thought is that, as particularly after age 30, that the brain is less malleable, period, less plastic. Um, that doesn't mean you stop, but anything that happens like when the person's five, like tremendous changes can happen compared to 50. And so if there are adaptations, there's probably going to be smaller and less. There are some things which we know now can stimulate neuron growth and change that. Um, and generally a rich environment for people will keep their brain a little bit more active. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, once you... I better, or like I'm going to have like literally millions of people on the internet being like, Aah. yeah. Once you've completed um, or gathered, you know, a lot of data from within all the 
I mean, because ENFP, you said, is what the most generalized type. And so maybe we're seeing the more generalized over time brain function. Do you have on set to see that same pattern throughout, or do you think maybe one of the most specialized types might be specialized? Um. Yeah, you know, so that's one of those questions where some of it is like the the lazy part of me is like, let them all be ENFPs, please. <laughs> and then the, the sort of like rigorous part of me is like, oh, like it would be really great to see that ISTJ and ISFJ are like all specialized each in their own way, depending upon their life experience. Um, and that's the harder story to tell. I don't know what the answer is yet. The preliminary stuff I've looked at before suggests the second one, the more rigorous work is what the case is going to be. Um, and that yes, it was nice that the intern was an ENFP and picked the ENFP, but it may be if she had picked ISTJ, that would be more difficult. And I do plan to analyze the whole database just by age changes and just by sex and just by career. And, and see if those patterns really hold up. So far, the ones we're starting to look at, it does seem like they're, they're, it holds up. Not, we haven't looked at age yet, but by sex and career area, those seem to hold up. Because we've looked at like ESTP and ISTP, which seem like significantly different from ENFP. But um, time will tell, yeah. And depends on how hard those, those intern elves work. <laughs> yes. yes. Yeah, so uh, you mentioned uh, something to the effect of technology development or emerging or work of this eventually wanting to move towards more of a human development. But this is this is not yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, and then there was a slide where you mentioned briefly about there was an aspect of the interviews that is linked to uh, or correlates to an idea of uh, how many TV shows of the kids or or yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm ultimately curious if, if if some of this research could lead to the helpful understanding of maybe a link between things like to something like intuition or some sort of uh, assistance in um, helping us understand the link between sort of uh, mm. high functioning mood disorders and ADHD or mm. some of the things like that. It does, um, and I predict somebody else will do that work. Um, in part because I've tried to screen out people who have medical, you know, like clinical uh, diagnoses, because then I feel like they're going to skew the results. I have like one example of somebody with Down syndrome where that was not easy. Um, and then I've had a couple of people with on the spectrum with basically Asperger's. Um, and, and there's interesting phenomena that happen with those. Uh, there are people I've had that, yeah, they had ADD, but they don't have it now, or they take a medication to offset that. Um, and so I just don't have very many. I mean, literally, I can count like half a dozen people in the whole database, and I just sort of did it more out of curiosity. Like the one person I had come in who was taking Prozac, and I just wanted to see like what, what happens. And as, as, as I had predicted and read, like, the brain activity was really muted during the session. It's like watching the ocean on a really still day. And I thought, but that, what are we going to get? But fortunately, when we did the computer analysis underneath and it showed the brain wiring, the brain wiring was normal. Like you would expect for his, his INTJ preferences, and that's, we got that. So um, uh, and, and my intention, once I like, look through all of the data I have now and do like this level of detail, is like, yeah, I'm. I, otherwise, I'm going to go nuts because, yeah. So I'll let somebody else do that. And there, there are people who are actually much more knowledgeable about that. And I think it's important to know, like, I'm not actually a neuroscientist. I'm just doing neuroscience research. It's not my training. I'm definitely not diagnosing or treating disease. And I find it difficult to work with those people, too. Like, I have had somebody, um, two people, to round it out, like one who came in, he was diagnosed with depression, anxiety, and, uh, oh, something else that wasn't good. Um, and it was difficult for him to even do the one hour because he's like, oh, I feel it's like, you know, he had like psychosomatic symptoms during the session and then was becoming anxious and all that. And I'm like, I don't know how to deal with in that kind of situation with clients. 
Like I'm a fun people person, not like a take care of you people person. Yeah, and so uh, I, I really suspect, and I really hope that once I get to a certain point that will inspire other people to go and do that. Cool, so uh, by the way, great questions. We could probably even have some more in a little bit. And I, I'll be here tomorrow, yeah. You will be here tomorrow? Yeah. Oh, I thought you had to fly out tomorrow, that's well, great. I, I do have to fly out tomorrow and I'll be here. I thought it was like first thing in the morning you were going, no, that's fantastic. I, I don't no do idea. anything first thing in the morning. <laughs> yeah, I go to yoga in the morning, that's yeah. what I do, yes. Yeah. I had no idea you were be here, Thank okay, you. that's yeah. great. Uh, you, uh, like kind of what Christian uh, alluded to when he asked you this idea of human growth, this mm. idea of growth. I know that's something that's very much top of your mind. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's obviously top of our mind too. As an INTJ, yeah. I just want to ask you a personal story. What mm -hmm. are some of the things you personally have done that have really been growth avenues for you? Mm. Whether growing your type or your person, just your person in general, but what has worked yeah. for you? What's been some of the things you've really latched onto have been really those impactful things? Um, thank you, I've thought of this question before. Um, I think I could give a, a reasonably short list. I would say one is spending a few years growing up in the Caribbean and probably what's an ESFP culture was really fantastic and very healthy um, because it served as a nice counterpoint in a time when I was exposed to school and social values and so on that were very balancing. It was very nice. Um, I would say uh, like role playing games, not video games, like tabletop, like socializing, thinking, designing, all of that had a huge positive impact. Uh, eventually allowed me to not only do stuff in games, but do computer modeling and simulation in my adult life. Uh, very, very helpful. Um, Neuro-linguistic programming. And not that I didn't get certified in that or whatever, but became enough familiar with it, took some workshops. Was just became aware of it, that there are ways to use language that can limit us or can free us. Um, and, and that was very powerful. Uh, I'd say an engineering degree helped me a lot, and I knew that I probably wasn't going to be an engineer in the traditional sense, but it's a great, torturous, but great degree. Um, uh, I would say knowing type, that that was a huge, huge impact from the very beginning with it. Um, it really, and fortunately my natural intuitions about how I thought people were similar or different fell very neatly into type. Like I didn't think about it a lot, but when I was exposed to type, this wasn't like some huge like counter to everything I thought. I didn't have a different way that I organized. I already saw the world as like, well, they're nerds and they're jocks and they're art types. And basically if you yeah. saw like, what was that movie in the eighties where they're all stuck in school and- Breakfast Club. Breakfast Club. I mean, that was my model. And actually that's not so far away. It's a stereotype, but it's not so far away from type. Um, and I would say in the, the ability then to work with people in the type community like Linda Behrens and Roger Pierman and all of these people who are really, uh, really long-term researchers is really great. Um, I would say systems thinking and so the way some of you may be exposed to that today is through integral theory. That's not how I was exposed, but this idea of chaos and complexity that the world, you don't just have rules and you don't just have statistical analysis, like there's a level above that that the world can actually make sense, that there are patterns, that there's complexity, that there's things like feedback, that there's um, sometimes a very small thing that you do can have a huge impact. We know that it's chaos, like from Jurassic Park. Sure. You know, th those kinds of concepts that really shaped like the potential to see everything. Uh, I would say I was very lucky to grow up and uh, with my mom as a nutritional biochemist. So she was talking out against high fructose corn syrup in the late 70s you know, decades before the culture was having a conversation about it. So I grew up in a household where the food was healthy and there was variety and that was all very good. Uh, I would say that had a huge impact. So I'm just not talking about the mind, I'm also talking about body and, and all of that. Um, uh, I would say a little bit later, uh, there were certain things I did like I really enjoyed teaching but what UCLA taught me really was about the nature of large institutions, like our government, like probably any institution in the history of the world. That as a student, I thought it was about learning and getting A's, of course, and graduating, getting the piece of paper, but learning. And then I began to understand it's about research. No, it's about money. No, it's not even about money. It's about ego and power. And that's then the nature of institutions. I mean, I've seen tremendous, other people will tell you, I knew somebody, I know someone who works, who worked in accounting at UCLA, it was like tremendous misconduct that happens there. 
And so I'm not surprised by those kinds of things. So there's a certain realism, and I'd say that had a huge impact. Um, especially for an NT, I'm like, yeah, I'm not surprised. <laughs> you know, it's sad, and it's disappointing because it's so, I see a tremendous, like when in our lifespan, in, in the traditional institutions, are people exposed to ethics? I do mean ethics as a course that you're going to study and get an A on. I mean like you held up to ethical behavior. Ethics, lawyers take ethics classes, but then you talk to a lawyer and they're going to say, well, it's all about how much you can lie and get away with. And, and so that's very sad. So there's a certain school of hard knocks. Um, You'd mentioned something at dinner I didn't want to bring up, but if you yeah. wanted to mention that as a growth that you had said, I, I don't want to. <laughs> yeah, no. So I'm, I have a few more things to okay. put in. Um, one, the other thing is I would just say in all, all of my very long-term relationships are lessons in type development. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the reality setting in that when I was younger, I sort of cognitively understood what type development was about. And now to really begin to understand what it's about, I'm like, no wonder it's called midlife and after. So I would say midlife is definitely a period where I'm like, oh, that's what feeling is about. The feeling, like vulnerability. It sucks, but it's fantastic. <laughs> but it sucks. Um, and learning how to do that, like I've been taking an acting class, and I would say that that's had over a year, and it's really, really by an INFJ teacher. By the way, I have completely renewed respect for INFJs, both the students and the teacher, because like what the teacher can do in that class, making people feel comfortable, learning without feeling criticized, being able to connect empathically, to be creative, all of this is just really, really fantastic. So reminder time and again, the type has been helpful. Um, I would say psychedelics, like you had mentioned, was huge, huge impact combined with type. And I think that's very important because I see a lot of millennials involved in that now. Their heart is in the right place, but it doesn't magically make type development go faster. I think it removes blockages, which is fantastic, but they still, I, like I work with an INFP for a lot of things, and he has the usual challenges of a 30-year-old INFP. He knows he tends to be dogmatic. Uh, if it's important to him, he can be moralizing. He can get very rigid um, as weaknesses. And yet the work has also allowed him to know, oh, but I know that this is like, he doesn't have a label for it. He doesn't know this is, you know, introverted feeling that's like coming on too strong. But, but he knows, like he's learned how to deal with that. And I'm like, oh, this is cool. And when you get to like your, your other side, your other preferences, and I'm just a Jung in general, Jungian psychology, I continue. And I would say if you love type, and you want to make use of it, because multiple times in my life, I thought, oh, I've learned everything I need to know about type. And then I discovered something more that Jung had to say about it. And I would say like the, 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 the polarity stuff is very powerful, very useful um, to, and this was such a thing. So at San Francisco, in San Francisco Association of Psychological Type, Linda Behrens presented on um, basically what was like, what sorted out to be like type development for, for INTJ, ENTJ. And they, but they were with the opposite. And about half the group could be, and I was like, yeah, I see where I use like extroverted sensing, introverted feeling integrated with the rest of my life. And then there were other INTJs, ENTJs who were like, oh, we don't do that at all. And I saw a lot of it was because their career didn't give them opportunities to do that because their life experience didn't push them to have to do that, whatever that is. So I would say, go into that Jungian depth psychology stuff, and that has a huge impact. Um, and they would say living overseas in different countries, just in general, not even when I was a kid, just going now. I would say that that continues to be huge impact. And that's, um, cultures are different. I don't like every culture, and I do love to travel, but some of them might be like, yeah, I'd live there for five years, and others would be like, nope, that was fun, but... Um, but it still gives appreciation for the diversity of it. So I would say that's like a pretty good range of. That's fantastic. Okay, yeah. so uh, maybe we just we can uh, ask you this: as far as the passion of type and the growth that you were talking about here, what do you think that maybe students like ourselves, all of us learning this, what what is the? I mean, we talk about growth, but what are some maybe? 
something else we can look at just besides the personal growth. When we're looking at type, uh, where do you see the best focus? Where do you see, besides growth, but where do you see the best thing for us as profilers particularly, mm. trying to understand other people, how they tick? What are some things, maybe even counterintuitive things, we'd be working on that that we can do to improve our skills in determining and reading other people and understanding type? Um, I'll give, I, I don't know if I have a broad answer, but I have a specific example of an answer. I have learned, so I have a very good friend who's an ISF, has ISFP preferences. Something I have come to realize, which is very, very tough for me, is that when he says something, he only means that in that moment. And that two hours from now, or two weeks from now, or two years from now, be like, what? Oh, I didn't mean that. Or I only said that because that's what you wanted to hear. Or I felt that way at the time, but then later I didn't feel that way. And that was, is just so devastating to me as a paradigm, because it's like, if I actually get to the point of feeling something or saying something, I mean it. I may change how I feel down the line because of other things that happen, but that doesn't undo the original experience. And to think that there are people who go through life who can actually just rewind and be like, oh yeah, like let's just like reinterpret that experience and feel differently about it. I'm like, oh my God, like that's just wrong. <laughs> well, no, that's how somebody operates. That's how SFPs in general operate. There's context. And then there's the emotions in the context and they use that as an important piece of information and they're gonna say stuff and do stuff and they're like, that was me then. And this is me now. And it was just some like paradigm breaking stuff that is, is just still to, to come to terms with that. Is, um, Cause I still like to think at the end of the day as an INTJ, people say what they mean, they're pragmatic fundamentally. Um, Everybody has the capacity to be creative and think outside the box and wants to. Um, you know, you can pitch an idea and people can fill in the blanks for themselves. Um, no. And some of that, I, I don't mean that in some high place. I mean, just like the differences are really real and they're really serious. And it's anybody who's been married to some of a different type for 20 years, you're gonna know that already. And you'd be like, God, how do we, even, like we're so different, even if you're only one letter apart. And, and it's just being hit by something so strong as that, that just what was said only was true in that context in that moment. And yet that's what allows the ISFP to be 100% alive in that moment, is to simply trust and not think about consequences, or do I really mean this or whatever it is. It's just like, it goes from A to B, and there's no like filters or gates or checkpoints or whatever in between. And that's just, uh, I would say that's huge, is the appreciation of that. And I would say if you want to learn more about that, just, and I've done this at times where I picked out, like at one point I'm like, okay, I think I'm sort of ready to not be intimidated by ESTPs. <laughs> Let me focus on ESTPs. And the first thing I tried to focus on was just seeing e ESTPs in my environment. Like noticing, oh, there's an ESTP probably or like at a meeting or something, let me to go and talk to that ESTP. And remembering the things I had learned in type, like already have a sense of like being able to move quickly and like what do I want out of the situation and not sounding like a bumbling idiot, you know, when I get to this person. And, and just it's to stretch and to spend time with people who are very different types. Because so many, I mean, I see people on the internet who type stuff like I don't have any sensing friends. And they, they wear that as a badge of honor. And I'm like, that's a, sort of a handicap long term. I understand where you are now. Maybe you were burned by something or you're like looking for like, you know, similarity as a way to ground yourself. And I get that. But if you really, really want to, to understand the different types, you have to spend time with them. I mean, for this book, which I'll mention, so all of you are getting a free copy of this. Go and pick up. Okay, so this is based upon, there are four versions of every type. Okay, they're biographies with little illustrations But this guy in New York, and you can tell they're all New Yorkers. Um, and this ESFJ just randomly opened Mary, who's a businesswoman. There are ESFJs who are business people, including grandmas, okay? Um, Fernando, who's a dentist, Sandra, who's a stage performer, and Saul, who's a senator. They're all based upon, each one of them is based upon two individuals of that type, so eight interviews. 
I learned a lot about type by interviewing these people and then putting them together in biographies and sort of blending them and saying like, here's some examples of type and, and to know that there's both the stereotypical stuff and there's the surprise stuff that's sort of atypical. And that's, um, you know, so do, do know, make sure you get your copy because I brought like 80 of them. So, and you don't have 80 people here, right? Uh, so we do coming and going all week. So okay. we'll, we'll sure definitely everybody. have enough outlet. And so you only just take mention, one then. Yeah, yes. take, take yes. one. Yes. And then also mention you have two other books that they could pick up there for sale because uh, yeah. obviously you can't give all the books away. Right. But yeah. what are these about real so, quick? So these here are, um, for, if you like what I talked about today, but would like to actually be able to see what's on the screen. Um, <laughs> but the beautiful thing is, okay, this is glossy and, and, it's color, because people kept asking for color, and it's in big print, <laughs> okay? So you can sit with a friend and be like, see, this is people who identify with the same preferences have brains that are usually very similar. Notice it's like half the pie. So it's a great way to introduce people to type, and it does have an introduction to type at the same time as it talks about the brain. Um, and this is normally, it's like $15, it's $10 here. And then this one here, Eight Keys to Self-Leadership. Um, there's such a story behind this book. So Gary Hartzler, who's been a person in the type community for a long time, I found out he was writing a book. This is like 15, 10, at least 10 years ago, 13 years ago. I found out he was writing a book on exercises for each of the eight functions. And he, the book was coming out in less than a month. And I happened to be that quarter not teaching. And the guy who told me, my friend Chris, I was like, you know what? I need to write this book too, and I think I could do a better job, but he's gonna think that I base my stuff off of his. If I'm late with it, I better get started writing. So I wrote this book in two weeks, um, <laughs> and it does not show, you would not know. Um, but the reason actually I was able to do it is because for the two years before that, I was part of something called the ListServe, for those of you who are old enough to remember what ListServes are, and huge, like 40, 50 people who were top people in the type community we're all participating and we had monthly speakers and they talked about type in depth and all the kind of stuff you would get here, but for like months and months. And I went away and my brain was like, Lenore Thompson is over here and Danielle Poirier is over here and like all the things that they said and it just like And, and uh, I, I would sleep and write and exercise and then sleep and write and exercise and I got in some eating and so the, the important part is, it's a great story about introverted intuiting, that's why I told you. Um, but the reason is there are over 50 different exercises in here to help develop the eight functions. Yeah. I was just gonna say the uh, exercise we use tomorrow for extroverted thinking comes from the book. Oh, excellent. And so, yeah, well, with your permission, I oh, remember yeah, I emailed you, I was like, hey, yes. is it okay if I rip this off of you? Yeah. And you're like, yeah, yeah go yes, for please. it. But it yes, comes from yes. that book, that book is really good. Yeah, thank you. And, and it divides the active into like basic, intermediate, and advanced level. So if you're talking about like your tertiary function, you don't need to jump to advanced. You can try like low intermediate level and see how that goes. And some of them are quick and some of them you can spend a week. Really hard one with introverted feeling is to just shut up and listen for a day. And before you're tempted to say something, just don't. <laughs> oh my God, that's so hard. It's so hard. So they're, they're, some of them are easy and short like that, and then other ones really are like in depth and thinking about what does your conscience say about something, or if you're building a model, like is the model elegant? Like there's, it covers the whole range of things. A lot of people put, you had mentioned at the beginning of your talk, a lot of people put a lot of faith in what you're doing. Mm. I think you'd mentioned they had a talk, or maybe it was a dinner earlier. You'd mentioned this at some point tonight. Yeah. I don't remember when. <laughs> it's been a long night. Uh, but uh, this idea of putting faith in your work, this research mm -hmm. you're doing, it's almost like people are like, oh, finally. You know, my friends tell me I'm a crazy person or I'm stupid for thinking about Myers Briggs or, or personality types. Is anything real? They say it's not scientific. But there's this guy, Dario, Dr. Dario Nardi, doing brain yeah, yeah. research, and he's going to prove once and for all, we can hook people up to brain scan no. machines. He's going to prove that yeah. type exists. Yeah, take yeah. that. You know, this kind of uh, yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. there's a lot of expectation on you. I, and I, I feel, thank you for mentioning that very much. And I feel that. Uh, no, I do. And in fact, I would have stopped my research already if it weren't for that, because I really do feel that weight. Uh, I think ultimately Jung uh, in type to some extent will triumph over things like five factor model, which are sort of sterile and don't give people anything to run with. 
Um, so I, I think that there's still, it has inherent value with the meaning level, whether I was here or not. I do want to say like, is this, the first book was only pilot study. You know, the first time I came out with stuff and that was after five years and that was just a pilot study because I'm like, I know that the traditional way, and I don't mean traditional, but like the boring sort of small, simple way of looking at the brain is not going to pan out because type is a really complex subject. And it's like, I need to approach it in a complex way. And even now, I'm just like, if I can get to this point with all 16 types, no matter how that pans out, and just like be able to present that, I will say that, and, and I can say now, that the brain research says that type influences your result. There is a correlation, even to say not causation, there is a correlation between brain wiring, brain activity, and your type. That statistically, you are more likely to have active brain wiring between or activity in regions that are sort of clearly you look at what they do and like those are going to be supporting intuiting or thinking or sensing or introverted sensing or whatever it is. I do believe there's another level beyond that. Um, people ask, you know, I did a pilot study, I didn't publish the pilot study in a journal because like you don't publish pilot studies. And it began in a very messy way, it's just like a training lab. At this point, not a lot of journals support type. And when I do publish, I actually probably won't start even mentioning type at the beginning. I'll be looking. And now you can't publish about sex either, which is really irritating. And even though the big story is actually much more interesting. So I think I'll probably be reduced to talking about career and age. And, and at that point. Why can't you publish about sex? Um, you know, people have responded to this way. But they're uncomfortable with the idea that there are sex differences. Um, so science just like you just like, oh it's not it's not a science issue like it, it's it's a, it's a public readership issue gotcha yeah you would have uh, maybe some backlash or the appeal to the science would be challenged if you went down yeah, that road. It's, yeah. in other words it, it's people would be unable to hear it because it would trigger them in some right way. yes okay yes okay. and okay. not that it would be challenged technically it's not because a whole bunch of medical research always looks at like men and women are different because we have different hormones and sure. like this and that. And we see the differences disappear, probably anyway. So I think it makes sense. Um, but I would say uh, I'm just trying to give an example of what we can do. Yeah. And I do believe, and I had pressure from some people who were very the pro-type, and they're like, "Why aren't you finished yet?" <laughs> I'm like. Because what I'm doing is really hard. <laughs> it's really hard. And a lot of them are really irritating things that I, with intuiting preference, don't like to deal with. Like, I've used two different machines, and one of them has, it measures 16 regions, and the other one measures 19 regions, or you can add a 20th region. And I'm like, then I have to reconcile all the data, and I have to do it in a way that's like defensible. And then every person has a different normal level, so results have to be normalized, but like, you don't want to over massage your normalized data because then you'll get criticism. So there's like all these things to think about. And then it's like, oh my God, ESTJs are like the modal type in the population for men in America. And I just, it's so hard to get them. I've even tried with the military. And the military was like, we'd love to, but we're already enrolled in like three other neuroscience studies. Mm. <laughs> yeah. And that's just so, so there, I, I'm just gonna say, I'm doing my best. I'm aware of it. Uh, I hope I inspire people. The technology is changing all the time. So I'm going to tell you after I publish with this, I would love for somebody else like 10 years from now to run with it with some machine that measures like 900 regions or whatever it is that they're going to have um, and do that. And I can be in the South Pacific somewhere. <laughs> so remember last night we were talking about what are you going to do? What are you going to do with this? And if somebody wants to be ambitious, and follow in his stead. Mm. Nerdy is looking forward to retirement when it comes to this. <laughs> and there's some really interesting things going mm. on, I think. Um, you're leaving tomorrow, you said? I have a, like a 5.30 flight okay. in the afternoon. Oh, in the afternoon. OK, yeah. so um, Melissa, what time does your friend come in for your profiling session tomorrow morning? Nine, OK. Um, so uh, it's getting kind of late, yeah. and I think we people are wearing were down. Tomorrow, so we're I didn't know that. Oh, okay. Would <laughs> you be willing to? Would you be willing to do a profiling session first in the morning, and then Nardi, do, uh, uh, Daria, would you be willing to do your? Um, I don't know. I've just always called you Nardi. Like yeah. since the very beginning, it, for, it's, ten, it's for ten years. Is, it's not actually the, the last name I grew up with for most of my oh, life. That's interesting. So it's a weird experience. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I had a bunch of people call me Dodge, and I'm like, that's not the name I grew up yeah. with either. Yeah. Um, so uh, would you be willing to do the demonstration tomorrow? 
I think that's a fantastic idea. I think idea. so too. And、uh, how long does it take? Um, Hour, no, fi- no, fifteen minutes would be great. There you go.、Yes. So why don't we do your profiling session in the morning? Then we'll do a post game, and then we'll do your demonstration. And I think that that would probably okay. Yeah, and I'm already losing my voice、okay. anyway.、So、All right, that's yeah, fantastic.、Cool. All right, thank you,、uh, Dr. Nardi, for being、mm-hmm. here. Absolutely,、yeah. thank you for inviting、yeah. me. Yeah. There's more to come. I didn't even、yeah. know.、So、this is a surprise to all of us.、Yeah. There's more to come tomorrow morning. We'll see everybody back in here at 9 a.m. for、uh, day three of the Washington D.C. version of Profiler Training 2019. Woo! <laughs>